in. If you, um, you are more than welcome to keep your video off today, just I do want to let you know we are recording. We'll be showing um, some slides, so most of you won't show up on the screen. Um, okay, looks like we got most everyone in. So anyway, I'm going to start over again. Hi, everybody. It's so awesome to see everybody here. Um, I'm Lauren Traster. I work for the University of Vermont. Ex you can't hear Sage. Sage, can other people hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, so Sage, I think you might need to go into either check the volume on your speakers on your actual device or click on the little carrot next to your mute button and you may need to set up your audio. Oh, but she can't hear me. <laughs> I'm giving her I'll, I'll type it in the chat box. Okay, yep. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we'll introduce Hannah in a second. So as I was saying, I'm Lauren Traster. I work for the University of Vermont Extension Service with the 4-H program. And I have been running in partnership with the Vermont um, Fish and Wildlife Department, the Natural Resource Management Academy. Oh my goodness, I think this was going to be our 13th year. It's normally an in-person program at the Green Mountain Conservation Camp. But as you all know, this is a very strange world we're living in. And we didn't want to just get rid of the opportunity this summer, so we decided to create um, the Virtual Natural Resource Management Academy. This is um, something near and dear to my heart. Um, even though I work in the youth development field, my background, I have an undergraduate degree in environmental studies, and I also have a master's degree in natural resource management planning from the University of Vermont. So even though that's not the work that I do, um, day to day, I like to introduce young people into all of these different areas of natural resources and environment. And through the week, I'm going to share some other programs that you can get involved in through UVM Extension 4-H um, that can help build your um, natural resource skills and leadership skills around environmental issues. So I want to get started today. I'm going to do a screen share. We're going to give you the lay of the land. Oh, that is not the right screen share. Apologize. Let's try that again. Why is that? All right, what is going on? You know, you practice things ahead of time and hang on one second. I apologize, guys. So while I'm playing with this, Hannah, who is my partner in crime today, is, um, I'm going to have Hannah, why don't you introduce yourself quickly? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Phelps. I work with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and I um, help run the conservation camps that we normally have the Natural Resource Management Academy at. Um, so this summer, we, we don't have camp open, but we've been up there do, working on the buildings and stuff and keeping them um, all up, up to date and, and ready to go for next summer. That way, hopefully, we can have Natural Resource Management Academy, along with our other programs, live in person again next year. Um, so that's sort of what I do is I, I run those facilities and I've partnered with Lauren on this to help bring you guys an awesome program. I'm really excited. Well, thank you. So can you all see my screen now? Yes, awesome. All right, so what we want to do, because we're going to be spending the week together, we really want to have everyone have a chance to introduce themselves and tell us where you're from. So we're going to use the chat feature for this. So open up your chat box, make sure you select all panelists and attendees, and why don't you tell us who you are and where you're from? Um, that way we can all kind of introduce ourselves to each other. You just met myself and Hannah. Let's see who else is here, right? We got Megan and Brianna, Lexia and Sage, Aaron. We got some New Hampshire and Maryland and Maine. So the cool thing about Natural Resource Management Academy going virtual is this has really opened it up. We have um, a lot of Vermonters with us this week but we also have people from other states, which is really cool. And you can see where everyone's from. Wow, we even have someone from California. Ethan, thank you for joining us. So this is great. Every day when we come together, 
we're gonna have you introduce yourselves, but each day we're gonna ask you a different question. And Hannah and I have come up with some good questions <laughs> to get you thinking. If anybody needs closed captioning, um, Hannah's gonna put a link in the chat box right now that all you're gonna have to do is click on that link and there'll be live captioning um, for you. So that is available today. One of the things that's really important for us when we're together is I want everybody to open up your participant list and change. If it doesn't show your full name, your first and last name, I want you to click on rename and type in your actual first and last name. And we want to do this for many reasons. Um, one, is it's really helpful for us um, to get to know each other. It's good, it's good etiquette when you're in online meetings um, for people to know who's actually here. Um, we are gonna ask that you put your first and last name. We have multiple people who have the same first name and Hannah and I need to get an accurate attendance list every day. Um, I think you all know that if, for those of you that do choose to come all five days this week, you're gonna be getting a certificate um, from, for participating in the Natural Resource Management Academy. Um, but we also wanna be able to distinguish, I know we have multiple Olivia's, multiple Bowden's, multiple Jasmine's, and we need to know who is who. So please go and rename yourself first and last time. Here's the thing to know. The participant list does not show up on video. So we will not be saying your full name on the recording. Um, this is only for us, so that doesn't show up anywhere. So I see many of you have. I do see a couple people still just have an initial or just their first name. So please make sure, um, those of you who have not done this yet, make sure it's first and last name. We're gonna ask you to do this every day. Um, so that was really good practice today. And just know that when you come in um, other days to go ahead and do that um, and we'll remind you. So our protocols for when we gather virtually. So you all are muted and we're gonna ask that you stay muted. Um, you will have the opportunity to speak if you'd like to. And what you're gonna do is use the raise your hand feature. So again, if you go up um, to your name on the participant list, one of your options will be to raise your hand and we will unmute you. So we're gonna control that. And that's just because there's so many of you, it just makes things run a little smoother. Um, you can share your thoughts and questions in the chat box. We just ask that you remain um, courteous and respectful to one another um, throughout our time together. Make sure you don't create any distractions. So if you do have your video on, Try not, don't move around your house. Try to stay in one location. Um, try not making silly faces and make sure there's nothing distracting going on behind you. Um, and again, the chat box can also end up being a distraction. So try to stay on topic with the chat box. Um, again, the have your first and last name showing. So if you haven't done that yet, and then just stay engaged, participate fully. I know we have a lot of interaction in today's presentation, so really looking forward to getting to that. So moving along, unless there's any questions, and you guys can ask questions at any time. Um, we are gonna be, hopefully you all know the schedule. So each day of our week, there's a different topic and a different natural resource professional coming in to share their work with you. And what we've asked each presenter is to share some at-home resources with you. That is for, for you only, there's no requirement. We're not giving you homework, we're not telling you to do anything. It is just if you like a topic and you wanna go deeper into that topic, we're gonna to give you some resources that, so that you can do that, all right? We are here to help you just learn about this field and all the different pathways you can take um, within this. So, we're gonna do a quick icebreaker and every day we get together we are gonna have an icebreaker for you so today I have put up six different quotes environmental quotes I want you to take a look at these and then in the chat box put the letter for the quote that speaks to you which one do you think kind of that you identify with or that kind of just 
is sort of your, maybe it's your mission statement in life. And then if anybody wants to share, um, just raise your hand and, and let us know why you chose the one that you did. I'm gonna give you a few minutes to take a look. And Hannah will be monitoring, to see if anyone raises their hand. But just kind of look at this. And we got some people coming in. We got some bees. Be the change you wish to see in the world. We've got A, what I stand for is what I stand on. I know I see a couple C's coming in. So I can't really read that because Hannah's picture is covering it. Hannah, can you read C or are you covering that too? I can read it. It says, if people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I bet they'd live a lot differently. And then I've seen a couple people have said, D, if you really think the environment is less important than the economy, try holding your breath while you count your money. Let's see, I know, I don't know if I've seen, oh, we just did get an F. Be a part of the solution, not part of the pollution. I don't know, oh, and we just got an E come in. Maybe I should have been giving all the naughty kids solar panels instead of coal. Does anybody want to share why they chose the one that they did? Do we have anyone who's raised their hand? We'd love for maybe a couple of people to say why they, why they chose the one they did. I'm also trying to convince a few of you to get comfortable speaking. I know it's a scary thing, but it, it's gonna make our time together a little bit more interesting if some people will be willing to speak out loud. Oh, okay, Sophia V, I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, why is that on? Um, hello. Hi, Sophia. Which one did you choose? chose D because I think it's um, really relevant in the world today because um, politicians, um, especially in America, seem to be really concerned with the economy and not so much with the environment these days. Great. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to Olivia D. Um, I chose B because not to take um, a twist on Michael Jackson, but it kind of, you can't just expect others to fix everything. You have to kind of help too, I guess. So nice. I yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And Lillian A. Let's see. There we go. I chose the one in which I chose, I couldn't decide between C or D because C, like, you know, the stars are so beautiful. It's like, there's like a sense of calm when you look outside it and see like a full sky, full sky filled, okay, a star filled sky. There you go. I agree with you. I couldn't decide between D because it's like, I mean, like, if you're so caught up in your money, like, think about it. That money comes from trees, so you wouldn't technically have your money if it weren't for the trees, and you wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the trees. And, like, if the trees wouldn't be alive if it weren't for the water and the sun, and yet they would be overcrowded if it weren't for the animals that eat them, and those animals would overeat the trees if it weren't for the animals that eat them. So it's like a really big important cycle and if you and if something gets unbalanced everything can fall apart. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that Lily and I appreciate that so much. So you guys did great. Thank you for those who were willing to raise your hand and speak out. And I know throughout um, today and through the week there's going to be different opportunities for you all to share in the chat box, raise your hand to share out your thoughts as well as we're gonna have some interaction through polls. So I'm gonna turn over to Hannah. She's gonna introduce our presenter today. Awesome. Um, so today presenting, we have Kim Royer. And Kim Royer is a wildlife biologist with the Vermont um, Fish and Wildlife Department. 
Um, during her 38 years with our department, she's helped landowners improve wildlife habitat, done extensive research on bobcats, coyotes, and other fur bearers, worked to restore his Vermont population of American Martins, and she's worked in our central office as a special assistant to the commissioner. So she's done a lot of really cool work, um, especially with her fur, bearer biology, fur bearer biology, and we're really excited to hear her presentation today about land and wildlife changes over time. So welcome, Kim. Go ahead and take it away. All right, and I just unshared. Okay, okay. great. Thanks. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and I'll, let me just share my screen. And I think that's it. Oh, sorry, Kim. I unmuted you. Oh, unmute yourself. Okay. I was Here just saying, I was just putting everybody back on to mute, and apparently it also got you. <laughs> okay. Can everybody see the screen now? No. You, no. You got to do the screen share. Yeah, I did that. Okay. How about now? In a second. There's a slight delay. So there we go. Got it? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, hi everybody. I actually even I can't even see you now. So I'm I'm sorry that we're not together in person because I'd really love to meet all of you. It just seems like from the few responses you've given already that you have a lot to share. And um, you know, the responsibility, I hate to say this to you, but the responsibility for the future of this earth is going to depend on you guys. So uh, good luck with that. And I'm hoping that by understanding some of the things that uh, we did in the past and some of the benefits and some of the, the, the um, changes that we've actually made for the benefit of wildlife will help you going forward. So that's why we're going to talk a little bit about history. So we're going to start. Um, whoops. Just, oops. Okay. We're starting quite a ways back. Uh, basically at about the time that Jesus walked the streets of Palestine. Um, but we're, we're centered right here in Northern New England. And I apologize for those of you who are from California or further away. This slide program is based mostly, mostly in New England, but um, I'm sure there were similar histories uh, in the rest of the country. In New England, we had a Native American population that were by necessity, um, lived fairly sustainably. They lived lightly off the land. And that was because they really were hunters and gatherers. They moved around a lot. They weren't really tied to agriculture in Northern New England, especially. Um, so they could only take what they could carry. And because of that, um, they really didn't overtake in any specific area, but they would take what they needed for food and clothing and maybe even some tools and then move on to another part of the area. And so they had a very sustainable culture, very egalitarian. Everybody was pretty much the same. Nobody was richer than anybody else. Um, and they basically had a relatively um, subsistence type of living in Northern New England based on the wildlife that was here. So they hunted and gathered plants and wildlife that were in the region. The forests here about that time were very similar. Like if you went out in the woods, uh, you'd see the same trees now that you probably would have seen before the Europeans got here. Uh, what's interesting is that the composition of the forest is probably somewhat different than what it was back then in that um, we probably have less beech and more maple. Our trees are not as old as the forest was back then. Uh, we had many of the same species that we have today. Uh, things like otter, uh, fisher, beaver, which we'll talk about some of these, but we also had wolves, mountain lion, um, and passenger pigeon back then. So some of the species have, have, have actually sustained themselves through the time with the help of us now, um, and some of the species have actually gone extinct in northern New England. So I'm just wondering if you guys have a sense, based on these, this list of wildlife here, the wolf, the white-tailed deer, the passenger pigeon, the bobcat, the moose, and the turkey, which one of these animals might have had um, the most influence on the makeup of the forest? And I'm launching a poll right now. You should see that pop up. If for some reason you don't see it pop up, you can just put your answer in the chat. Uh, otherwise, take the poll. And we'll see what you all think.
And they're coming in fast and furious. Yeah, we'll give it a great. couple of more seconds. Try to get a few more of you to respond. What do you think? It looks like the majority is saying the wolf. Yeah, and I understand why people would say that because uh, the wolf certainly as a top predator influenced the prey base underneath it, um, and which also would have had an influence on the forest because white-tailed deer, for example, if we have too many of them, they may heavily browse regeneration in the forest and, and impact the forest in that way. But probably, and this is going to surprise you guys because it's it's one of the the, the lowest um, responses. It was in fact the passenger pigeon, I would say, and and it's and we probably don't even realize this because most of us have no exposure to the passenger pigeon because it went extinct um, by the late 1800s or early 1900s. Some of you may remember there was one passenger pigeon named Martha left in, in a zoo. And I think she died in 1914. That was the last passenger pigeon. But passenger pigeons were considered an ecosystem engineer. And that was because they, would, they were migratory, but they would come in in huge flocks and land in an area that could have been the size of hundreds, if not you know, 30 square miles, almost thousands of acres. And they would roost there and even, um, and even um, set, put their nests there. And those birds would spend the time, so much time there that the nests would actually break the limbs of the trees. Their guano or dung would be as deep as two inches thick. And um, they basically create these patchy holes in the forest that, um, that created a type of patch dynamics that once they were gone, did not occur anymore. So they actually changed the whole composition and age of the forest unlike almost any other species except one other one that we're going to talk about in a little while. So the fact that these are gone um, is, is, is pretty shocking in terms of what effect it might have had. And I'm just going to read you a passage out of a book by William Samuel from, this is from 17, the year 1794. The number of pigeons was immense. For hundreds of acres together, the ground was covered with their dung to the depth of two inches their noise in the evenings was extremely troublesome and so great that there was no sleep. About two hours after sunrise, they rose much as in such numbers as to darken the air. And some accounts suggest that, that they would darken, their flocks would darken the sky for up to hours. So these were millions of birds that would fly into an area. And probably if they, if they showed up again today, we'd consider them a huge nuisance. But back then, they also played a huge role in the forest. So just an interesting um, animal that is no longer here. So the Europeans had a different view of wildlife than um, the Native Americans that were here. And that was because they were much more sedentary. Whether you lived in a castle or whether you lived in a thatched hut, it was pretty darn cold in Northern Europe. And you needed, you needed furs in order to stay warm. And they used furs for rugs, they used furs for garments, they used furs for blankets, they used fur for, furs for curtains. So furs actually had a monetary value. And by furs, I mean the skins of these animals. And so they would, they would catch these animals and then trade them, say the Finns would do this and trade them in England for the other things that they might need. So they would use these as money, like I said. Beaver was probably the most sought after animal. And I'm just wondering if you guys would guess why they were the most sought after. Was it because they made awesome pets or because they tasted good, they made great hats or they were easy to catch? All right, hang on one second. I'm gonna get that poll up there. Uh, that's what I have to do, okay. All right, the poll has been launched. Are beavers good pets? Are they tasty? Do they make good hats? Or are they easy to catch? And I'm going to make an announcement. There's a couple of people I'm trying to do attendance. I have not been able to match a couple of people against our registration. So I am private chatting a few of you. If you see that, take a look. Um, because I need to know exactly if you're listed under a parent's name 
I need to know who you are. Um, so I'm going to be emailing a couple of you. And I can say out loud, there's someone, Amy D. There's someone listed as SLR. Those are two that I need to know what you can privately chat me if you want. That'd be great. So it looks like from our poll, we let's try to get a couple more people to answer. But it looks like overwhelmingly people think beavers made good hats. Yep. Okay, so let's go and see. And they were, their fur is uniquely suited to felting. So those of you who said they make great hats, you are, you are correct. That is generally why they were sought after. And when I say that their fur is uniquely suited to felting, they have an under fur with these tiny microscopic barbs that when pressed and processed actually create almost like a thick felt. So those of you may be familiar with Abe Lincoln's tall hat that he's very famous for. That was a beaver felt hat. It doesn't look much like felt, doesn't look like beaver fur, but that hat was made out of beaver fur. Many cowboy hats, all of the European hats back at the time were made out of uh, this, this pressed beaver fur, under fur. But those of you who said that many parts of the beaver, that the beaver tasted good, the beaver did taste good. I mean, they're an herbivore. They eat just um, vegetable matter. So people used to eat the meat and they would actually even eat the tail during Lent because it was scaled. And instead of fish, they would replace beaver tail. And they were easy to catch in that if they lived in a lodge or a burrow, they, people could just block the front entrance and, and go after the beaver. They had no seasons, no bag limits on beaver at this point in time. Nobody had any concerns about a population decline. And so by the mid 1500s, they basically extirpated beaver from most of Europe. And you would have thought this would have raised a red flag for people saying, gee, maybe we better start to control how many animals are taken or when they're taken. But instead they just sent uh, people further into the reaches, the remote reaches of Siberia and Scandinavia and kept going. And eventually um, the beaver basically were gone from the European landscape. And it's, it's hard to imagine how important furs were to the people of Europe at that time. But just to give you a sense of the sale of furs, uh, by the end of the 13th century, they, everybody basically had some kind of fur clothing item, if not more than one item. And this kings and dukes, the wealthy people, would bought, buy many, many uh, pieces of clothing. So this particular, these, these kings and dukes owned as many as 20 to 30 garments. And this one King Edward I, from 1285 to 1288, so over a three year period, he bought 120,000 squirrel pelts a year. Not, I can't imagine what he did with them, but that's the amount, that's the volume of animals that were being taken with no seasons, no bag limits. Again, so this completely unregulated taking of fur, most all the other fur bearers were also extirpated um, around the 1300s. And this was a fairly low population of people living in Europe at the time. But something happened, I guess you could say, uh, in the nick of time uh, for the fur trade and for the hat trade in particular. What do you think that would have been? All right, let me get that poll launched. All right, so what do you think? What happened that saved the hat trade? Beaver populations in Europe exploded due to changing habitats. North America was discovered. People switched to wool hats and garments or beaver hats were no longer fashionable. I don't know about you, I love a good beaver hat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, looks like, well, let's get a few more in. We are getting a leading contender. Yeah. North America was discovered. Give it a couple more seconds, but I don't see that changing because okay. it went up. Good job, you guys. 
you are correct um, that basically they discovered a whole continent um, right about the time when they had eliminated most of the resources in Europe. They discovered North America and, um, and found what they thought was an unlimited supply of not only fur bearers, beaver and other, other animals, but also um, you know, trees. And um, so they ended up coming over here. Many of the cities today, New York, Boston, and up the coast, were basically founded as trading colonies for, for fur bearers. Hey, and Kim, to yeah. Tovin asks a good question in the chat. Yeah. How yeah, do you sure. tell if a hat is a beaver hat? Um, well, I'm sure today they can probably mimic um, the felting the felting process and make a a synthetic hat that looks like a beaver hat, but it's generally um, what I think of as a really it's going to be an expensive hat, and it's going to have a, a felt type quality like um like a it'll it'll feel it'll be like a cowboy hat if anybody can think of what a cowboy hat looks like that's generally made out, an expensive cowboy hat's generally made out of beaver felt. Um, or even a derby hat, sometimes expensive derby hats. So they're, they're usually a thick material that, that has form and holds its shape. Um, beyond that, I, I might be able to be fooled by something synthetic. So I'm not positive that you can always tell the difference, Tovin, these days. Okay, great question, Tovin. Yeah, and feel free, you guys, to ask questions as I go through this, if, if something comes up. So... So the Europeans came over and they met this Native American culture that had not changed since the time that Jesus was walking the streets of Palestine. So we still had people who were essentially living in the Stone Age um, throughout the country. And they were still living um, off of the animals that they could, could, could catch. Um, and some of them were tied to some agriculture. Some of them were starting to grow crops. But like I said, in northern New England, Vermont, and New Hampshire in general, um, most of them were still hunters and gatherers and still moved around a lot. And you can imagine these folks come along and say, I'll trade you um, a knife for a beaver skin. And I'm just going to read you a little passage out of Alice Atwater's book called Water, um, which is on the list. And just to give you an idea of what the natives thought. So at the onset of the fur trade, 10 good beavers, adult winter prime northern hides that were stretched and cured, bought the Indians one gun. One good beaver bought variously half a pound of powder, four pounds of shot, a hatchet, eight jackknives, half a pound of beads, a good coat, or a pound of tobacco. The beaver does everything perfectly well, an Indian trapper told a Jesuit priest in 1657. It makes kettles, hatchets, swords, knives, bread, in short, it makes everything. The English have no sense. They give us two knives for one beaver skin. So at first the natives thought, oh, this is amazing. I mean, we're getting linen, we're getting kettles. Instead of having to use like um, woven baskets, we're getting knives instead of using beaver teeth. You know, so they, they started to trade heavily with the Europeans. And in fact, they did the bulk of the trapping for the Europeans and brought the beaver to these concentrated sites where they would trade. And it happened so fast. And then, and then most of you know the story of the Native Americans in that um, many of them caught diseases from the Europeans. Their culture began, became decimated. They became more and more dependent on the fur trade. And so oops. by the mid 1760s, and this is an important number to remember, the 1760s, we're talking a hundred years before Vermont and Northern New England was even developed by Europeans, a quarter of a million beaver had been taken out of the Connecticut River Valley alone and shipped to London. Um, so huge volumes of beaver were coming out of this region and we really did not have a very high population of humans at the time. It would be hard to overstate how important this search for beaver in particular, but other species like um, Fisher and, and Martin and um, raccoon and all the other fur-bearing species 
uh, that were sought after drove the exploration for this country. And basically, what's amazing to me is that when the first wagon train went west I, in the mid 1800s, beaver were mostly gone from the west at that point in time, except for higher elevation habitats. And they have really not been completely restored to this day. Um, so the people that, that followed, that went on the wagon trains, the pioneers that went west were actually following the trails that were laid out by the early trappers that went west in search of fur bearers, including beaver. So it really had a huge um, role to play in sort of the development, for better or worse, in the development of this country. And it's hard to believe that you could uh, decimate a population like beaver because a family of six beaver, um, and this is sort of um, a schematic, it's not, it doesn't include any real mortality. So a population is not gonna quite grow this fast, but a family of six beaver, two adults and, and two juveniles and two, um, and two teenagers could become actually 600 beaver in 10 years. That's how fast that population can grow. So it's hard to believe that they actually were able to, to act, almost extirpate the population. And what happens is you, you have, let's just say this is a beaver lodge with a dam. You've got a family group here. Like I said, two adults, uh, two that are probably one or two years old, and then two youngsters. And those um, two-year-olds get kicked out in the spring after the, after the babies are born. They get kicked out. And they go up or downstream about half a mile or so and establish another dam and another lodge and another family in acceptable habitat. And then they just keep going. And that's how a whole area that has high quality beaver habitat gets populated or repopulated by beaver. And there's some estimates that prior to European settlement, there may have been as many as 300 beaver dam per square mile. And when you think about it, a square mile is about 640 acres. So if you had 300 dams and each one of them held back an acre of water, you could have as, many as, as much as half of that square mile in some form of beaver habitat. But beaver tend to be um, cyclic in that they basically will form a pond like this one, and then they'll basically eat everything they can. And in about 10 to 20 years, once they eat all the available food supply that they really like, they move out of this pond and they go up or downstream and maybe start to flood this pond here. And they, once this pond is abandoned, it starts, it, it, the dam blows out and you get this nice wet meadow that's another kind of habitat that's just as high quality as this one. They're all just different types of habitats. And you get what we call patch dynamics. So the beaver is another species that creates the same kind of patch or a different kind of patch dynamics than um, say the pigeon, the passenger pigeon created. So both of those animals prior to European history created a whole unique type of forest um, and unique forest type um, that wouldn't have been there without them. So we call a beaver a keystone species. Um, anybody want to take a guess as to why it might be called a keystone species? Passenger pigeon could also be called a keystone species, I think, which gives you a big hint. Okay, so I'm going to launch, are you ready for me to launch the poll? Sure, yep. Yeah. Okay, so our next poll why are beaver why are beaver called a keystone species so your choice is because they are keystones in their dams to hold them in place because they are the key to finding water because they provide habitat for a lot of other species or because their fur is valuable and the key uh, to getting rich Kim, while we're waiting for answers to come in, yeah. Sienna had a good question in sure. the chat, um, yeah. and that is, what is the difference between a beaver and a muskrat? She and her mom see a ton of muskrats, but never yeah. really any beavers, she doesn't think. Yep, um, that's a great question, Sienna. So beaver have a flat, a big paddle-like flattened tail that's flattened uh, laterally, and a muskrat has almost like a, a rat tail. It's also hairless. Um, but it's vertically flattened, so it's, it's, and that's kind of hard to see. 
but it's a much narrower little tail. Um, and usually muskrat are often found in beaver flowages, but you also may see muskrats in man-made ponds quite a bit more often than you would see beaver, although once in a while they'll, they'll end up occupying man-made ponds as well. Um, and muskrat really need cattail type vegetation and other type of aquatic vegetation in order to have a decent food supply. Um, and also they make, they make their homes or their lodges out of things like cattails, vegetation, whereas beaver use sticks. So it looks like a uh, very large percentage yeah. think uh, they are keystone species because they provide habitat for a lot of other species. That's great. You're exactly right. And so they, they basically provide habitat for a lot of other species by building dams on, on streams. And they like low gradient flat streams. They build a dam. Anybody want to take a guess as to why they build these dams? You just put it in the chat box and, and either Lauren or Sienna, I mean, <laughs> yeah, Lauren, or, or raise Sienna your hand brain. That's if right. you want. Or raise your hand if you want to speak, if you want to just say it, that would be great. So Meredith says for protection. For protection to the beaver. Yeah, and, and what, what, We why? have to catch food to hold in water to make their own pond. Uh, protection from predators while they forage, expose fish on the other side. Yep, that's Cold exactly. Waters. Yep, so, so they, beaver, if you picture a beaver on land, they're round, clumsy animals. They don't run very fast. They can't escape predators easily on land. While in the water, they're, they're acrobats. Um, and so they create these dams and they respond to the sound of running water. A beaver family can create a dam, a 35 foot dam in a week. And they create these ponds and that gives them access to a food supply that they would not have had access to without having that water, that larger uh, water surface available. And they rarely go more than 100 to 300 feet from the edge of the water. So, uh, this is, you know, they, they create these dams and they build these lodges. And by doing so, they create these beautiful wetlands that provide habitat for a, a whole host of other species. Um, and you can just see some examples here because the trees tend to die that are, that they flood, then you, then holes are created for things like wood duck, pileated woodpecker, great blue herons use these places. Um, here's the picture of the muskrat. It's not, it doesn't show the tail, Sienna, I'm sorry. Um, but this is, it does look a lot like a little beaver. So you really have to sort of check the tail out in order to tell the difference. Um, moose also. So these species and some others probably declined in the late 1600s and early 1700s when beaver populations declined. Anybody want to take a guess as to what some of the other species might have been uh, that might have declined? And some, um, and there is no real right answer here because we don't have an answer. Nobody was tracking wildlife back then, so we don't really know. But what species do you think might have declined as a result of the loss of the beaver and those ponds that they created? So Addison wrote fish and insects, and Lila says ducks. Uh, more fish and species who fish from Sophia and Eva says wetland thriving creatures. Uh, a couple others have said fish. KL says deer and other grazers. Aaron says black bear. Uh, Tovin species that live in shallow ponds and bogs. Brenna says moose and Katie says plants. Xander also says moose. Lily here fish, and then Ethan says aquatic birds. Sienna, tree, fishers, geese, frogs. Uh, Olivia, other animals that eat fish. That that is so great. Yeah, that, I mean that's a pretty comprehensive list, you guys. And and these and are there just was more. I there just were. Wow. So much. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, I again, I I mean the fact that you brought up invertebrates, uh, fish, birds. I mean, there have been some studies that have shown as many as 92 different bird species using four different beaver flowages. Um, again, somebody, somebody I think brought up frogs and 
salamanders. I mean, we don't really know, but my guess is those are those types of habitats are critical to these species. Turtles, snakes, uh, deer. I, there's so many animals that use these beaver flowages, and chances are that once they declined, many of these species declined as well. Mink, that's a picture of a mink in case you, the little white chin. So Vermont was settled and, and Northern New England in, in particular was settled quite a bit later than Massachusetts and Connecticut. And we hardly had any European, well, I, I shouldn't say was, it, we had many Native Americans, but in terms of being settled by European settlers, Vermont really didn't get settled into the late 1700s. In 1760, we had 3,000 people of European descent living here. And they came up and they, they created these little subsistence farms. They carved out a little patch of land out of the woods. Many of you who take hikes in the woods might see the stone walls that are remnants of these old farms. And they started clearing the land. And most of these folks were sheep farmers, or they had a couple of li cows for livestock and maybe tried to have you know, some corn and other, other types of uh, plant material to live off of. But they were trying to eke out a living up here um, in the cold climate of Vermont. And by 1790, so we're talking 30 years later, we went from 3,000 people of European descent to 85,000. And by 1800, 155,000, and each one of them was clearing their little patch of land, creating these stone walls, like we said. And by about 1850, I'm just wondering if you can take a guess as to, we were 95% forest before the Europeans started to settle here. How much forest um, was cleared, do you think, by the mid 1800s? 20%, 50%, 70%, or 90%? What do you guys think? How much of our forests were cleared by 1850? Thinking about all those people who came to settle here. Looks, looks like the majority are going with 70%. Yeah. Give it a couple more seconds. You know, Jack put in the chat, he also thinks 70%. I think that is our consensus. Yep. Well, good for you guys. As usual, you are correct. Um, about 70% of Vermont's, and I, I suspect similar in, in most of the New England states, you know, might vary from a percent, you know, from 10%. Maybe some states had 60, some states had 80. Um, but around 70%, a huge amount of our forest was gone for both um, the sheep industry, the potash industry. Um, and so by about 1850 um, to 1880, we only had 30% of our forest left. And you can imagine for species that require forest habitat, there were a lot of species that declined as a result of this. Yeah, and Aaron put a big, uh, nice comment in the chat thinking, do y'all ever think about how we only have one single old growth forest left in Vermont? Even though we have a large forest cover now, it was all replanted. That's right. It's all come up. Most of it is actually, some of it was replanted during the CCC. You're right. Very much so, Aaron. And then a lot of it has, has come back on its own, but that's why we say it's a different forest than what we had prior to European settlement. And many species um, that were threats to the settlers that were here uh, had bounties on them. In other words, if they shot an animal like a wolf, and we had wolves back then, uh, they could receive upwards of 10 or $20 per animal. And uh, I actually found this out because I went to the Vermont historian, the archivist's office, and I was looking for lynx records. And he said, Kim, I have something you might be interested in. And he went down these crickety steps and he brings me back this leather bound book, huge leather bound book. And it said, Wolf Bounty, 1777 to 1789. And inside were these receipts that were signed by Ira Allen and Thomas Chittenden. So I think what happened was that when a settler would kill a wolf, 
He had to cut the head off, rather gruesome, take it to his county clerk. The county clerk wrote out a receipt, sent it up to the state treasurer, who at these times was either Ira Allen or Thomas Chittenden. They signed it and sent back $20, which Gregory Sanford, the historian at the time, told me was about three months salary. So there wasn't just the incentive to protect their livestock, but also an, in, an um, economic incentive to go after these species. So Kim, so, you actually had to walk into the town clerk's office with the wolf's head? Yeah, I believe that's what that was what was explained wow. to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So they had to have a tough stomach. <laughs> um, and and so, you no, know, what I did was I had all these records and I had um, the Middlebury College students actually um, entered it into a computer for me and they created this map. So I'm just wondering what you guys think the dots on this map might tell us about wolves or anything else. You can, you can just either raise your hand or put it in the chat room. This is Jacob, Jacob yeah. asks, so wolves must have been rare? Well, I, we don't, that, the reason why I was interested was because we didn't know anything about the wolf population historically. We don't know whether it was an Eastern Canadian type wolf or a gray wolf. We don't know how big it was. I was actually hoping these records would have weights, which they did not. Um, but, but I think, does anybody have anybody have any suggestions? Yeah, or? so br both Brenna and Jasmine wrote, um, they're marking the, the territory or where they lived. Um, Eva also thinks that. Um, Sophia said maybe places uh, where they were hunted more. Okay. Um, but it seems like most people think that the dots are representing territory or, or uh, or where they live, but Aaron says maybe where the packs were wiped out due to hunting. Well, I think, yeah, Sophia, I think, hit it on the head, and, and to some degree, um, basically what I think this tells us is where Vermont got settled first. So you had people coming in from Albany, New York, into sort of the southwestern part of the state. That's where there were interactions between humans and wolves, and that's where the wolves were taken. And then you had people coming up the Connecticut River Valley and settling here, and that's where there were interactions between humans and wolves, and that's where the wolves were taken. Slowly but surely, there was movement up here, and I'm sure this continued up into Northern Vermont. We just don't have the records for that because it doesn't go beyond 1770, and this one, 1781. Um, so it, it tells us more actually about the settlement patterns of the people than probably it does about the wolves, except that we know that wolves were here. Um, so that's important to know that they were here. And you'll notice these blue dots. These blue dots were actually mountain lion sighting, mountain lion um, bounty records. And I don't know whether they had a separate book for mountain lions and those got mixed in, or there were so many fewer mountain lions that they just stuck them in the wolf book and um, they just had much larger territories and they just, they just were not here and in such, in such high densities. But it did show that back then there were mountain lions and they were being killed and people were getting bounties for them. Thankfully today we have no more bounties. Um, so these were all other species that, were dec that declined or were actually extirpated. And when I say extirpated, it's like going extinct only locally. It's like local local extinction in Vermont. So we lost some of our most iconic species throughout this period, mostly because of the changes in land use patterns, the clearing of the forest, but also because of unregulated harvest at the time. So we lost turkey, we lost white-tailed deer, we lost fisher. We lost, um, well we didn't lose otter, but otter certainly declined as a result of beaver, beaver, um, beaver decline. And because otter are at the top of their food chain, they're really susceptible to pollution. And of course, during the 1800s, our rivers and streams were incredibly polluted uh, due to some of the industrial 
industrialization that was going on at that time and you know all the effluent was being put into the streams and otter you know just that builds up in their system and affects their reproductive rate so they declined for they had they had a couple of of hits against them um, so from 1760 the late 1700s to 1850 we basically managed to eliminate most of our most iconic species um, throughout that period in northern New England. Um, so what species do you think um, might have, besides the one I talked, the ones I talked about, the, um, we talked about the white-tailed deer and the turkey and the fisher, what other species do you think might have declined throughout that period? Ones that might have been sensitive to either uh, pollution in the water or uh, clearing of the forest or unregulated harvest. You can just put it in the chat box if you have some ideas. Uh, Addison says moose, bear, and he's thinking. Xander said moose. Uh, Lila, deer, fish, and moose. Jacob, trout, moose, and bear. Ella, fish. Haley says fox. Tobin says catamount. Rina, moose, fish, wolves. Eva, fish, beer, <laughs> bears, and moose. Oh, and now it's going so fast. Daisa says squirrels, bats, and bobcats. Ashton says moose. Uh, we have ducks, fish, and frogs from Paige. And Olivia says moose, fish, and birds. And I know I missed some other entries because it's going so fast. Lillian says yeah. frogs, salamanders, and fox. Tobin says passenger pigeon. And Carter says coyote. Good. I'm glad to hear that you guys were listening. And I think, you know, except, except for fox, which is kind of interesting, and we'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. This is just a, a list of species that we know of that declined as a result of the, the, the forest transformation and um, unregulated take and or, or, or just, um, you know, pollution in the water. So it, tur deer, turkey, otter, mountain lion, wolf, lynx, moose, black bear, many of, the, many of the species that you guys suggested, Atlantic salmon, passenger pigeon, beaver, American shad, lake sturgeon, bats. Somebody did mention bats, and I suspect there was a huge decline in forest bats, even though we really didn't monitor bats at the time. Uh, New England cottontail, likely. American martin, we lost. Timber rattlesnake declined. A lot of invertebrates, I'm sure, declined. Again, we had no record of those. And Fisher, just a just a few. I mean, I'm sure there were more. Um, but you know, many of these species we think of as very valuable, important species. And then by 1880, um, things started to change, and and the changes occurred both from a landscape perspective and from the way people started to think about the land. Um, anybody want to know? anybody know or want to take a guess farms started to become abandoned in in new england um anybody want to take a guess as to what were the things that that caused that started to cause that abandonment anybody feel have free any to raise your hand or yep. type in the chat box but we'd love to hear some of you speak uh we do have a uh, wool market crash um better land out west People deciding to move out west, so much mud, industrialization, uh, more productive farming methods, World War II, railroads, uh, no vegetation left for grazing, less demand, um, franchise companies like Hood Dairy, less nutrients. Wow, you guys are great. I mean, you you're... <laughs> You got it. You're right on. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, it started with the Civil War, but I'm sure that the addition, the, the, the subsequent wars also uh, might have influenced where people uh, decided to farm. But you can imagine the Civil War when many of the Vermonters uh, went to fight in Pennsylvania or Virginia and realized that trying to eke out a living in Vermont was kind of silly when there was this beautiful land um, out down south and, and out west. Uh, the, the coming of the railroad, somebody said the decline of the sheep industry, exactly, that's right. And the railroad allowed people to go out west and um, sheep farm and then ship them back. And then somebody else mentioned the Industrial Revolution. So um, 
great job, you guys. And so slowly but surely, and it continues to this day, our farms have become abandoned and started to regenerate with forest and trees. And so the species that really like that early, what we call early successional habitat, that low growing vegetation, like the rabbit and the snowshoe hare, they started to do really well. And these are ubiquitous prey species. So you used to have this sort of um, spike in, in prey animals as a result of that early successional habitat that's, that's growing back in again. White-tailed deer also are a species that does really well um, with low growing vegetation because they're browsers. So they started to, to take off after they were reintroduced in the early 1900s. And so this was considered an era of protection in 1867 because in particular, the, the pollution with the streams, the legislature actually established a fish commission, which was the precursor to the Fish and Wildlife Department to try to clean up our streams. And then in 1937, sportsmen actually lobbied Congress to tax themselves, um, to tax their, their guns and ammunition to put towards conservation work. Uh, and then ecosystem, the era, the era of Earth Day, ecosystem management in, in the 70s took a more holistic approach to how do we manage from a holistic standpoint. Um, so in 1921, some of those funds uh, from actually from licensed dollars that were started to be sold in the early 1900s went towards a beaver reintroduction and the purchase of a thousand, the first thousand acres in Vermont for conservation. So beaver, like I said, uh, we began a re the Fish and Wildlife Department actually began a reintroduction in 1921 to try to bring beaver back to Vermont. And um, they were protected in 1910. Once we bring, brought them in, we actually had a live trap and transfer program. We'd live trap them and take them all over the state and release them. And we did a survey, and you can't, I don't know if you guys can see the bottom of this, I can't, but in 1941, uh, we surveyed, well, not me, I mean, I'm, I'm old, but not that old. Uh, but 1941, the department surveyed to see how many beaver they thought were out there, and they came up with an estimate of 400. Three years later, in 1944, they did the same survey and they came up with an estimate of 1,100. And then um, in 1949, so eight years after the original survey, they surveyed again and came up with an estimate of 8,000 beaver. That's how fast. So remember that original graph I showed you when I said the population can grow that fast? That's how fast our population grew in the 40s. And again, remember, wolves, their major predator were gone. Native Americans, another major predator, were at much reduced numbers. Um, and so that population had very little mortality and just took off. And along with it started the, the complaints from people because beaver flood driveways, beaver flood roads. And so in 1950, there was a 15-day trapping season established and they harvested 1,100 beaver. The otter population started to rebound when beaver came back as well. Again, for all the reasons we talked about already. Um, additional recovery efforts in the 50s and 60s. Um, Fisher were brought back into Vermont uh, from Maine. Anybody take a guess, a quick guess as to for what reason? Anybody know? Uh, why fishers, did you say? Yeah, why were fisher reintroduced? That's this animal right here. This is called a fisher. Uh, Tovin says for porcupines? Yeah, good job, Tovin. Yeah, <laughs> they were actually, the Forest and Parks Department had a bounty on porcupines and um, they decided instead of paying out this bounty, which was thousands of dollars a year, they would bring back the natural predator and they brought fisher back in. Um, with our help, the department's help. In 68, turkeys were brought back. In 56, um, uh, geese were pinioned. Their, their feathers were clipped in Addison. If you can believe it, we had no nesting geese prior to 1956. And now, most of you are probably quite aware of the numbers of geese we have around. And in 89, 90, and 90, and 89, 90, and 91, we brought back this little guy here called the American Martin to Southern Vermont. 
I'm going to be probably, Lauren, I should probably try to wrap up by 2.15 or so. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Just so everyone knows, we are going to go to 2.30. So Kim's going to finish up her presentation and then we'll open it up for any questions you might have. And then we have a couple of things to do before you all leave today, but we will be ending at 2.30. Okay. So I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly, but anybody know what this animal is? Not this guy here, not this one. Anybody want to take a guess? Just raise your hand or chat it, send it, put it in the chat box. Got a lot of bobcat coming yep. in and yeah, one link. I should have known they would know the answer. <laughs> and we and have so a very actually, bright group. We do. Um, so many of those other species were extirpated. This guy did phenomenally well through this whole period. And bobcats had a bounty until 1971, if you can believe it. And even with that bounty, they did amazingly well. Um, and I would ask you this question, but I'm gonna go a little quicker. The reason why is when you remove top predators like wolves, mountain lions, things like that, the middle predators like fox and bobcats have less competition and their populations go up. So, you know, some of you thought perhaps fox had disappeared because of the forest clearing. Fox happened to really do well in cleared agricultural habitat. So between that, and the fact that they had no competition from larger predators, these two animals, their populations took off. And many of you may have read about what happened in Yellowstone to coyotes when wolves were reintroduced, the coyote population dropped by 50%. Well, this is the opposite. When you remove those predators, these mesocarnivores or, or middle-sized carnivores actually take off. And that's because their reproductive weight rate might be got up because there's more food available, more habitat available, and survival of the young are probably higher. And bobcats, it's amazing because bobcats are at the northern edge of their range. They live, um, if, they, if the snow gets deeper than about eight inches, it makes travel for them really difficult. So they often spend time in what we call deer wintering areas, which are often softwood stands on south facing slope where deer also spend the winter because the snow depths are less in these areas. And they'll actually um, feed on deer. Bobcat can actually kill an adult deer in the wintertime. And back in the old days, and I've had houndsmen tell me this, they've tracked bobcats through the woods and they've seen where a bobcat has killed a deer and cached it, traveled a mile, found another dead deer that was cached, another mile found another dead deer that was cached, until they found five dead deer. And all that bobcat had to do for the rest of the winter was travel from carcass to carcass to carcass and feed off of it. Can any of you see? This is a deer head right here. This is a deer carcass and this bobcat is covering it back up again. It just fed on it and it's covering it back up again. And this was a case where uh, a guy from Townsend, Vermont called me back probably 25 years ago and there were sightings of mountain lions in Townsend, and he found this uh, deer carcass and he thought maybe it was a mountain lion. And I said to him, boy, I wish we had one of those new infrared cameras. These were, these were new at the time. You know, nobody else had them. I, we didn't have them as a department. He said, well, I just bought one. I'll go home to Massachusetts. I'll pick it up and I'll bring it back up and I'll put it up. And he put it up the Sunday before Thanksgiving and he got two weeks of pictures of this cat coming back, uncovering the the deer, covering it back up again. And after two weeks, a fisher showed up and the cat never showed up again. But this was how they would eke out a living in the winter. But something happened that rocked the bobcat's world. Anybody want to take a guess as what it is, what it was? We have a poll for this. Let's uh, pop that up. So what do you think happened? Was it the snow depths increased? Coyotes moved into the state, deer wintering areas were all cut or developed, or the bobcats moved south where the climate was easier. So take a moment, take a guess, what do you think? Give it about 10 more seconds. For those of you who haven't got your votes in yet, but it does look like we are 
sort of uh, majority is thinking the deer wintering areas were all cut or developed. And, and that's a great guess because habitat's the key. And if, those, if deer wintering areas um, were lost, it would impact both, both bobcat and white-tailed deer. But in this case, I will give you a clue. It was this. That's a track of this guy. So actually, coyotes are not, were not here in Vermont prior to the 1940s. And as, as the wolves, so this is a typical coyote here. Um, you probably all seen or heard them. But prior to European settlement, they were found west of the Mississippi only, as far as we know. But they're much more adaptable to wolf wolf than wolves. And so as the Europeans went west and changed the habitat and extirpated wolves, the more adaptable coyote moved east. Most of them did not come by train. Most I was going to say, so are you trying to say that they're smart enough that they yeah, got a bus yeah. pass and uh, took the bus east? <laughs> this is like, this is to show how adaptable they are, but most of them came on foot. Um, so they came through, some of them came through Canada. In fact, the ones that came into northern New England came through Canada. And basically, they came from west of the Mississippi through Canada. They bred with wolves as they came through Canada and they came into, they crossed the St. Lawrence, which is really hard to do now because it doesn't freeze like it used to. And they came into northern New England. And so we actually had um, a researcher test our coyotes. He did genetics tests on our coyotes. This is what a Western coyote's genetics looks like. And it's all gray. So that's all coyote genes. This is what a mid sort of New York or Pennsylvania coyote's genes look like. And the red is actually the Eastern Canadian or Great Lakes wolf. And this is what our coyotes look like. So a third of our coyotes' genes are actually wolf genes. And so our coyotes are actually bigger than the Western coyote. They have bigger heads, they have bigger teeth, they weigh more, and um, they actually have a, a different family group dynamic in that Western coyotes tend to be very solitary. The Eastern coyote tends to function in family groups, not necessarily packs, but the adult parents and then uh, the youngsters tend to stay together longer than out west. So we often see maybe upwards of five coyotes uh, hunting together in the winter time. And this is because they've, they've done so well because they eat just about anything. So you can see here, this is a sample of the types of foods that they eat through spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, deer is an important spring food source, both dead deer deer that have already died, but also they will eat fawns. Um, and then woodchucks, really important, that's the red bar. Small mammals, the most important food supply for bobcats, I mean, for, for coyotes, for sure. Um, vegetation, like apples and cherries and raspberries, also really important. So they switch back and forth depending on what's available. And then in this case, domestic cow is this yellowish, uh, column and that's because it was the study was done in the Champlain Valley where farmers were throwing their dead cows out into the back 40 and coyotes were taking advantage of that. But again, they just about eat anything whereas wolves tend to eat moose, uh, deer to some degree and, and switch to beaver if those are not available. So their reproductive rates were very high initially when they first came in. Their survival rates were very high. If there's a lot of food and um, habitat available, they tend to do really well. They can have you know anywhere upwards of six to nine puppies if there's a lot of food and habitat. The study that was done in 1980s by Dr. Dave Person found that they actually were territorial. They defended home ranges about four to eight square miles and would not let other family groups or other coyotes come into those home ranges. So we know that we're going only can have a finite number of animals in the state. What we also found doing that study is that the fox, sometimes uh, the researchers would trap red fox in their traps. They used foothold traps to capture these animals and they'd come back and the fox would be killed. 
and they found that the foxes were being killed by coyotes. So they collared the foxes and they found that the foxes tend to set up home ranges in between where the coyote home ranges were because when they ventured into the coyote home ranges, their lives were at risk. So the, the entry of coyotes into the state probably caused a decline in our fox population, just like when it went the other way. The gray fox didn't have the same, that didn't happen for the gray fox. And I think it might be, we guess maybe because the gray fox can climb trees. They have semi-retractal claws like a cat and they can actually climb trees. Um, so they do pretty well. So now when a bobcat kills a deer, what do you think happens to it? And I won't bother to ask you to answer right now. Just take a guess in your head. Um, you can imagine when a bobcat kills a deer, there's a lot more competition out there, including coyotes. So now we have fisher, you know, a pretty well distributed population of healthy population of fisher. They'll come along, they'll feed on that, that carcass. Um, coyotes come along and actually, Today, you'll hardly even find these bones in the woods anymore in the springtime uh, because coyotes will actually disperse everything and all you'll find is a pile of hair. So a bobcat had to work a lot harder uh, to make it through the winter um, once the bio, bobcat, I mean the coyote came into the picture. So we saw a decline in our bobcat harvest from the 70s to the 90s. Luckily, that's gone back up again. Bobcats have figured out how to compensate for this competition and they, they've switched prey to small mammals and um, they, there's higher densities in the Champlain Valley than in the mountains today. Um, whoops. And so I'm not gonna go through this to just, just to show you that probably we have more bobcats today than we did pre-European settlement because our, our climate has changed prior to European settlement we probably had a climate, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, had a climate similar to Quebec, Canada. And um, so we actually have a much warmer climate today. So bobcats are doing better as a result of that. Um, and their population went way up in the early 1900s when the deer population, and remember I told you the small mammal population exploded due to the regenerating forest. That decline in the harvest was probably due to the reintroduction of fisher and, and coyotes coming in. We did a study, and I'm not gonna go into too, too much detail except to show you, this is a radio collared cat. These are, the, these are the points that that cat, this is the habitat it used. Anybody wanna take a guess as to, I think I, as to what it says about the types of habitat that bobcats prefer over the types that they don't? Anybody got any thoughts about that? When you look at this slide, I mean, you can Ellis almost tell with Woods versus fields. Uh, Sophia agrees woods. Jacob says forest. Ashton and Eva say woods. Haley says the forest. I think everybody's weighing in. They prefer yep. the trees. Good for them. <laughs> yeah, and so, and you are exactly right. It's woods um, versus fields. You can see if they're in the field, they're following these hedgerows. That's the way they're moving across the field landscape. Wetlands were also important for bobcats. Streams, right, what we call riparian ed edges of streams, riparian areas, also really important bobcat habitat. So many species we have today are more abundant than they were 200 years ago. It's those species that really do well with humans, like raccoons, uh, even, even coyotes, uh, opossums, skunks, uh, those that can adapt to the human, um, human changed habitats are doing really well. Some of the issues that we have today really have more to do with how do we deal with human wildlife conflicts, trying to deal with bears on people's back porches or in their compost piles or moose in people's backyards or running through their maple sugar lines. Beaver flooding roads. When you think about most of our transportation system was built um, with, with people not on the landscape and now we have, with beaver not on the landscape and now beaver are back and they, they flood our roads and our driveways and cause issues. We have a program to try to deal with that. Um, so anybody quickly want to, Give me an idea of what you think the biggest threats of this group, and there may be more than one, the biggest threats of wildlife today. So again, you guys, you can raise your hand or come into the chat. This, we're getting to the end of the presentation, so 
I remember we're going to be going to 2.30, so just hang with us. Yep. So Addison says people. Uh, KL says habitat loss. Tobin says disease and population loss. Jack says climate change and habitat loss. Jasmine also says climate change. And then now we're getting a lot of climate change coming in from multiple yep. people. Eva also says pesticides. Yep. So I'm going to go on quickly and just say you are all right and um, good for you guys. It is habitat. I would say habitat loss, fragmentation, and climate change are probably the top two and on my list right now. Although diseases and, and pesticides and rodenticides are becoming a bigger, bigger problem, changes in public attitudes towards wildlife, if they don't care about these animals, they're not going to want to protect them or the habitat they need. So trying to make sure that animals don't become pests is really important. Um, regulated hunting is thankfully today not a problem because we are so, we have so many rules and regulations over how many you can take and when you can take them. It's no longer a risk and these other issues really are. So habitat is the key. Don't forget that you guys, you've been so amazing. I can't believe at how much you already know. So thank you so much for being such a great audience. I know it's impressive. I want to thank Kim for um, spending our, her time with us today. We're going to do a quick poll just to get some feedback. And while we're doing this, if you have any questions for Kim, you can type them in the chat. But we're going to launch in a poll for you to just let me know, rate the, your, how you think of your knowledge gain today. So one is you didn't learn anything. Five, you learned a lot. And then two, three, and four is, is in the middle. We just want to be able to track that. We're going to do one other thing after um, to assess um, and hear what you learned today. But we're going to do this first. So I'd like everybody to take this poll. Um, but don't leave yet, because we're going to go over um, a couple of other things just to cover what we're doing this week. Um, does not look like everyone has taken the poll yet. So please. If you can, please take the poll. I'm gonna leave it open for about another 10 seconds or so. Kim, we have lots of thank yous and comments on how great your presentation was. So thanks again for coming. Everyone really appreciated it, it seems. Oh, good. Well, I, I, again, I wish we could, if anybody has questions about being a wildlife biologist um, or has an interest in it as a profession, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to talk to anybody about how you might get into the profession or what it's like. It's a great job. It's been, I'm so thankful that I spent my career doing this um, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Can Thank I you. put your email down in the chat box, Kim? Yeah, Is that sure. Okay? Yeah, do you know it, Hannah? Yeah, it's just- okay. And I can, so if life. you can unshare your screen, Kim, I'm gonna yeah. share mine again. So one of the things I'm going to let everyone know is I will be sending you an email a little bit. Um, I'm going to have to download today's recording. I'm going to send you an email that will include today's recording. I can also include Kim's email in that, as well as um, the, um, Kim, if you can unshare. I'm, yeah, I'm trying. I can't get back to. So you just, um, up high, there'll be a menu. That will give you so the menu is up oh, high. Okay, so so yeah, I got it. I got it. Thanks, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Sure. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen, and um, so one of the things that I'm going to be doing, I'm going to send you all an email. It's going to include the at-home activities that Kim shared with me for those of you that want to take a deeper dive. Um, the Zoom link for tomorrow's session will come tomorrow, um, but I will share today's recording out. Um, one of the things that I want to do right now is we want to, can you all see a whiteboard and a menu at the top? And I actually can't, Hannah, can you see people? Are they nodding yes? Uh, can you guys give us a big old thumbs up if you can see it just real quick so I can look through? Yep, lots of people can, so we're okay. good. Okay, so you you're gonna click on the button that says text, and I want everybody to write on this wall. We're calling this our wow wall. Share one thing that you learned from Kim today. And we're gonna just give about two minutes for you to think about one thing that you learned from Kim today. Don't use the pen, use where it says text. 
and you can actually have a text box like I am. I'm gonna say one thing you learned from Kim. And each one of you can find a spot on this wow wall and put in what you learned. And so they're, they're, they're asking how you do the text, Lauren. Do you see the menu? There's, there should be a menu that pops up at the top of the board. Hmm. I... Okay. Okay, at the, t there should be a menu that, and then it says whiteboard. Oh, someone mm -hmm. figured it out. Whose gray foxes can climb? I think put your cursor on the white wall and click okay. your cursor and that might open up a text box. So I'm trying something new. I appreciate you all. I see a lot of dots coming up. Um, a lot of arrows. Hannah, do you see a... a um, I don't. I'm having okay, You guys are definitely well. finding the drawer tool. Um, oh, here's one. Bobcat can eat deer. Yeah, some mm -hmm. people are figuring this out. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing this. We're going to do this in the chat box. So Colleen has a question. Okay, sure. Colleen, I'm going to unmute you. Is that what you're trying to do? Okay. Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, if, if you go when, when you are sharing, I don't see it now all of a sudden, but when you are sharing up in the green bit that runs along the top of our screen, you can click and it says annotate. And if you click on annotate, then you can draw on the whiteboard. Okay, so everyone mm. has to click on annotate. Do you yeah. guys want to try that again? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Okay, so I'm going to share the whiteboard again. All right, I'm going to clear this one. So it's under view options next to the green. You are viewing oh. Lauren screen. If you go under view options, you can hit annotate. And then your cursor should write. I don't know how to do it. Oh, yeah. And then there's yeah, the I get a menu that gives me the option for text where you actually just type. Yeah. So in that, in that, if you go to the view options and then annotate, then it gives you that whole menu, you guys. So you can choose text. It'll give you a text box. Okay, and then, um, yep. Clear. Okay. So, so listen, to, listen awesome. to Hannah. We're not going to use a pen. You're actually going to be able to use text. Ooh, okay. you guys are figuring awesome. This out. You guys are getting in it. So nope. if you're still having trouble, if you put your cursor all the way up at the top of your screen, a little green box will pop up that says you are viewing Lauren Tracer's screen. Right next to that, it says view options. Click on view options. It'll drop down a menu. And then it says annotate. And when you click on annotate, it'll give you a whole menu. You're going to click on text and then it'll pop up with a text box and you can type in one thing that you learned. If you guys are still having trouble with that, feel free to contribute in the text box. Um, and I can actually try to put up some of some of the other things that people are saying if you can't this figure out how to awesome. do it. This is awesome. I love what I'm seeing so far. And look at this. We're all learning oh. some cool technology today, too. <laughs> <laughs> so try to find a spot where nobody else has been. So I'm just going to add some that I'm seeing in the chat box as well. Um, And I'm going to give so, it about 30 You guys, it, it's seconds. not an, it's, a, Tobin says it's not an option on Android. Did you see okay, that? Okay, so Tobin, you can just type in one thing you learned in the chat box, and anyone else who's having trouble can go ahead and do that. Um, and I will add it to our wall so that everyone gets represented up here. I will try to keep up with everyone, but if you yeah. haven't, then we'll be reading them. Exactly, and you, and you guys can put it in the chat box. We just wanted to have an opportunity for everybody, and it's always fun. I know Kim loves to yeah. hear like, what people learned from her, and it's just a good way to just share our learning with each other. Yeah. It's so interesting to see what you guys pick up from. I mean, it's hard to know when we give these presentations to know uh, what to emphasize and what not. And, you know, it's interesting to see what you guys found interesting and important. Yeah. Okay, so you guys, I'm going to stop sharing right now. And uh, we're going to go, 
um, live. So we are at 2.30. I want to thank everybody um, for being amazing today. You guys are so knowledgeable, hopefully, and it seems like you learned a lot from Kim. Again, we want to thank Kim for sharing her time. And I would encourage any of you who really are thinking that this might be the area that you might want to go into to reach out to Kim. The best way to learn about um, a career is talking to someone who has that career. Um, so tomorrow we're going to be joined by Ethan Taffer, who is a forester, and he's going to be doing a session on introduction to forest management. So hopefully we will all see you again tomorrow. Again, I'll send out the Zoom link in the morning, um, but you will get an email from me probably in about an hour or so with the recording and the at-home resources that Kim is sharing. All right, so any questions? before we sign off today. All right, well, thank you all. Thanks everybody. And look, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks you guys for the help.